morning. morning. Isn't God's grace amazing? Amen. I just think it's so awesome how we can just see that story and we can just hear about just how big God's grace is, how much it's the heart of God to restore man from all of our mistakes, from all of our trials, from all of our struggles. So that gives all of us hope and lets us know that wherever we're at in life, that it's not over. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter how far we think things have gone or how much we think we've lost, that it is not over, that God is still the God of restoration, that God is still the God that makes all things new. And let me tell you, this Easter weekend was absolutely incredible, and a lot of people caught a glimpse of heaven that weekend. They, 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 they felt closer to God than ever before. They got a, just, just maybe a jump start from maybe being lethargic in their walk with God, or maybe they just got a shot in the arm, or maybe the ultimate thing happened in their life where for the very first time, they received Christ into their heart and they made Him the Lord of their lives. There are so many stories that have come out of that weekend and it was awesome and it was great and we celebrate those stories and we say, God, thank you so much for what you did in our hearts during it, that Easter weekend experience. But let me tell you something. Your story does not end there. You see, Jesus' story did not end on the third day when He rose again. It wasn't just this one event that ended the story. Because you see, afterwards, after he rose from the grave, he visited his disciples. He taught and he performed many different miracles all before he ever ascended back to heaven. And our story is now found in Christ's story. And through him, like Mark in the video, we now have greater purpose. But let me, a lot of times we have this question, what about all the previous chapters? What about all the previous chapters of our story? What about all the things in our past? Because you say now we have a greater purpose. Now we have new hope. Now all things are made new. But what about all those previous chapters? How do we move past our past and live like Jesus desires for us to? How do we live in that freedom that Jesus bought and paid for without being tied to our struggles? Folks, this is our story. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write that title down. This, uh, our story. Write down our story. And if you're following along online, you can follow on your phone or on your iPad or whatever through the Uversion app. We're still doing that. You can follow along in the notes. Just click on live, search for an event in your area, and you, you should see it pop up. Would you just bow your heads and pray with me? God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your story of sending your son to die on the cross to redeem us and to make all things new. Now, as we get into your word and we learn how to live that out, live beyond that moment, God, and how we grow in Christ, and how we take that next step. Help us, help our hearts to be softened and open to receive your truth, God. Because your truth is like a seed, and our heart is the ground. And I pray that that seed will be planted on good ground, and it will produce an awesome harvest. It will produce awesome results in every one of our lives and in those around us that we have influence and that we touch and speak to every single day. Father, I pray for changed lives, renewed minds. I pray that hope will be sparked and something will just be set off in this place today and in our hearts and in our minds that will cause a chain reaction of change and passion like never before. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody, join with me, said, Amen. 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 There is life beyond the tomb. The tomb was not the end. There is life beyond the tomb. Matter of fact, John 8 and 36 is a very familiar scripture. Jesus said this. He said that if the Son makes you free, you are free. See, most of us can finish the other end of that scripture. If the Son has made us free, the Bible says we are free indeed. We are continually free. We're continually walking in the state of freedom and realizing and understanding exactly how free that we are and exactly what Jesus has paid for, exactly what he has done as we grow in our relationship and in our walk with him. But so many people think that Christianity just stops at salvation. I raised my hand. I said a prayer. Someone prayed with me. I prayed the prayer of faith and I believe that Jesus is now living in my heart. He's making all things new and then boom, that's it. Okay, well, I guess I'm just supposed to be a nice person now. And and we don't know. We get kind of get lost in the shuffle and we just kind of think that, well, I guess we're supposed to wait around for Jesus to come back because he's supposed to come back or either I guess I'll just die, whichever comes first, and I'll go to heaven. And I guess that's just what I'm supposed to do now. I'm just supposed to wait around. 
But folks, there is so much more to Christianity than us saying a prayer and just being good people till Jesus comes back. Hello, somebody. There is life beyond the tomb. There is life beyond that one single experience. See, Easter was wonderful. Easter was an amazing weekend. It was an amazing time because people come to church and they focus on what Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection. And it was an absolutely incredible weekend because we saw people that come to church that that may be the only time they ever come to church. And they got to hear the gospel. They got to hear about how Jesus carried our sorrows and carried our wounds and all these different things and how we don't have to carry this stuff and how he's made us free and how there's new life in him and there's hope. And we talked about those things and some people heard that message for the very first time or maybe it just became real to them for the very first time and they gave their hearts to Christ. And we celebrate that and we say, thank you, Jesus. What a fantastic weekend. Let me tell you something about Easter that you may not know. If you're a pastor, that week wears you out. I mean, you need like some type of sabbatical after Easter just to recoup. And to make matters more fun, we tack on an explosion that week as well. Just so, in case it wasn't enough just for the Easter weekend, we make it a little extra busy. And let me tell you, it seems like every demon in hell is on red alert that weekend and is working overtime on Easter. Because let me tell you, just the attacks, the emotional junk, uh, all the different things that just come out of the woodwork during that week that that, that just want to distract and want to tug at your heart, tug at your emotions. It's just an attack, and and we have to recognize that. We say, okay, God, we got to focus. we got to focus on on what you want us to focus on. Focus on those people that are going to be coming that need to hear your truth. We've got to focus on that that weekend. And, man, it's, it's a struggle. It's a tough week. I'll, I'll be uh, real transparent and let you know that uh, that Saturday night service, uh, before we came out, I told the worship team, I said, guys, you, you guys are going to have to pray for me. I mean, this has just been exhausting. I just have been feeling this weight, and I felt just this heavy burden and this weight for the people because I felt like just lives were hanging in the balance. And let me tell you, it was amazing. And, and God did such amazing things Easter weekend at our church. Matter of fact, we had a new attendance record set at our church. We had over 740 people show up that weekend. And it was amazing. That, uh, thank God for that. I saw hands go up all over the place in every service. I saw so many people wiping tears from their eyes. I saw so many uh, emails come in, and I saw so many Facebook messages, and I had so many people catch me after service or give me a call and just tell me about how God had touched them or changed them or how something had become real to them for the very first time. Heard how in the kids' service that over 20 kids had given their hearts to Christ that we were able to pray with and, and began their journey and their walk with God. Just an amazing weekend. There were more people that came to Easter service this week week the, this last weekend they came to the Danny Cahill event that we had at the first of the year so Jesus is bigger than Danny Cahill <laughs> he draws a bigger crowd that's awesome and that's great but here's the thing that you and I need to think about all those things are wonderful we celebrate those things we high five each other thank you Jesus thank you God for all the hundreds of people that we were able to minister to and that heard the gospel and heard the truth but what now what next I mean you and I have these great experiences where we come in, we worship God, and we're moved to tears, or, or we may come in and see all the hands lifted, and we may see the, the, the large crowds, but after that Easter weekend, after that experience, what, what next? Is there life beyond that experience, or do we just wait till next Easter? Or Christmas, there you go, Wayne. <laughs> or Christmas. Yeah, what do we do? What, is there life beyond that event? You see, a lot of us have those Easter moments in our lives that are kind of like that, where those celebration moments. We get really excited. We may catch a glimpse of, of the goodness of God or the grace of God, or we may have an experience where we get really on fire for God, or we may get very passionate for God, and all of a sudden something happened. Something changed in us during that moment or in that service. Or maybe we went and heard someone speak at, 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 that was holding a special service, or maybe we just had an experience and it was wonderful. But if we're not careful, we'll begin chasing experiences and live from experience to experience, and we'll never grow. Oh, let me back up and say that again. If we're not careful, we'll live from experience to experience and we'll never grow. I grew up in a church that that had an experience addiction. 
And we were all addicted to experiences. And once, once our experiences stopped, then all of a sudden we thought, well, the pastor must not be close to God anymore, and that church doesn't have it anymore. And because they've lost the it factor, we're going to go find another church. Because we're not experiencing what we were experiencing. We wanted just to have a feeling or a service where we had an experience that changed us. Because we didn't want to change. We didn't want to do any work throughout the week. We just wanted to just endure the week so we could get to church on the weekend and have an experience and hope that that did it for us. And that's a lot how we live our lives. We live from Easter to Easter, from experience to experience. And we never learn that it's not just enduring life so we can get to church and so we can get free and so we can just have an experience. It's taking what we've learned in church and through the teaching of God's Word and through our fellowship with other believers that helps us face the week and be overcomers and walk in victory throughout our week. Because how many of you know, I don't care how nice and lovely things are, Monday's coming. <laughs> I don't care how much you enjoyed the music and the message this weekend, Monday's coming. You're going to walk to the same job with the same boss, with the same difficult people. You're going to leave this service today and walk into your house having to deal with the same things that you've been having to deal with. And you can either just hold your breath and hope that you make it till next church service. Or you can grow and learn how to be an overcomer when you walk through the doors. And that's the difference from living from experience to experience and learning how to be an overcomer. Learning how to live that life that Christ wanted us to live and answer the question of what next. Because there is life beyond the experience. There is life beyond the tomb. There is life beyond just going from one moment to the next moment. From one church service to the next service. From one Easter service to the next. If we just held our breath and just said, well, Easter was great. Let's, let's just keep on working on next year, I guess, because we have nothing to do in between now and there. We'd be foolish if we did that. No matter how great an experience it may be, no matter how wonderful it may be, now we stop and we celebrate and we thank God for those things, but we don't try to recreate that or live in that moment. We realize we still have work to do. Amen? We realize that the next day is coming, that Monday is coming, and we have to face that, and we have to step out in faith and trust God and take what we have learned and what we've experienced and allow it to uh, shape our perspective, allow it to shape our trust, allow it to influence our hearts so when we face those difficult circumstances in life that we can face them and be more than conquerors through Christ in us. Amen, somebody. Amen. You see, there's new life and there's new purpose beyond that single experience. Don't get caught up chasing that experience because growing in freedom and purpose is much more than just chasing a feeling or an experience. And Jesus showed us this. Jesus actually displayed purpose beyond the grave of our past. He showed us how to be more than conquerors from the things of our past. He actually displayed for us how we are to live this life post Easter, how we are supposed to live this life post-resurrection because every one of us that know Christ as our Lord and Savior have had an Easter experience. We have had a post-resurrection experience, and let me clarify for you what that means. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you said, I'm going to trust you with my life, and He came in your life and make, made all things new, that means that who you was died. That means the person that you were before Christ is dead. And now you have new life or that resurrected life of Christ living on the inside of you. And all things are made new. The problem is, is that so many of us, even though all things are made new and we have who we were with, is now dead, we still have this casket that we drag around with us of who we used to be. We still frequent, as I said last week, we frequent the doors of the antique shop of our past. And we go in and look around at all the old junk that's hanging on the wall. And we never move past our past. We still go back to the grave and we still look for all the things that are in the grave. We look for all the dead things. We carry around that casket. We go in the shop and we say, oh yeah, I remember this. Oh yeah, I remember that. But Jesus showed us that beyond this grave that there is purpose. That there is purpose beyond that grave of our past. Let me show you this in the book of John chapter 20. If you've got your Bible this morning. Turn over to the book of John, chapter 20. Now, let me set this up for you. John 20 is following up after Jesus has already been resurrected from the grave, and he's already appeared 
uh, to Mary, and he's already appeared to uh, most of the disciples. A lot of people have already seen Jesus, and everybody's saying, Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive. He, he, he's risen from the grave, you know, he did what he said he was going to do, and all these wonderful things. Well, because of that, word spread. And now these guys had to hide out together. And they had, you know, because now they're saying Jesus is alive. Everybody's worried that they're going to, you know, cause some type of uprising. All the religious leaders of that day did not want to have any problems because they had enough problems when Jesus was here. Now they're saying he's back. So these guys would meet in secret. And they would meet behind closed doors. And they would have different systems and things that they would have in place to let one another know that it's safe to come in. But Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Here they are meeting in secret, hiding, telling one another, spreading the news that Jesus is alive. And we pick up this in John chapter 20 and verse 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So here you've got Thomas, who's one of the disciples of Jesus, who walked and talked with Jesus, who saw the miracles of Christ, who saw him crucified, who saw him beaten, who saw him hang on the cross, who saw him be carried to the tomb. And now here he is. He, he hadn't seen Jesus yet. Verse 25, the other disciples came to him. They said, we've seen the Lord. He said to them, listen, guys, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. You have to understand something about Thomas. We give Thomas a hard time. I mean, Thomas gets one of these unfortunate Bible names that's really not his name, that's very unfair. What do we call him? Not only is that his name, he's also become a phrase that we use. Oh, don't be a doubting Thomas. I mean, that's just not even fair. I, I mean, we act like we would be so much better in that situation. <laughs> oh, don't be a doubting Thomas. Oh, yeah, I think all of us would have been doubting Thomases. Because guess what? The other disciples, they, they saw it. They, they didn't have to believe. They knew he was there. Hey, we saw him, man. <clears throat> yeah, right. I mean, if it would have been, you know, one of the other disciples, Matthew, we would say, hey, don't be a doubting Matthew. It, it just they, the rest of the guys saw him. Thomas didn't have that chance to see him. So he gets a bad rap. Kind of like another uh, person that we talk about in the Bible, blind Bartimaeus. That guy gets a bad rap. That guy was only blind before he met Christ. Now he's just Bartimaeus. He says, I can see. Stop calling me blind. I imagine that if Bartimaeus is in heaven, he's saying, stop giving illustrations calling me blind Bartimaeus. I am not blind. I haven't been blind since I met Jesus. <laughs> the stigma of blind Bartimaeus, the stigma of doubting Thomas. <coughs> doubting Thomas. Don't be a doubting Thomas. And here he is. But, but put yourself in Thomas's shoes for a minute. Cut him a little slack. Give him a little bit of grace here. We're grace people, right? Let's give him some grace. Think about Thomas. He's saying, I, I saw him beaten. I saw how bloody he was. The Bible says that he was not even recognizable as a man. He was so bloodied and torn and beaten and bruised. He was in such terrible shape. You couldn't even recognize him. And Thomas saw all this. Thomas heard the screams of agony. He heard the cries. He heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He heard Jesus breathe his last breath. It's finished. He saw Jesus hung between the two thieves. He saw all of this stuff. He saw them take him down from the cross and, and, and wrap him up and then carry him into a borrowed tomb. They, he saw all of this. And then here the disciples are just going to come and say, hey, Jesus is alive. He's saying, no, I don't think so. Unless I touch where the scars from the print of the nails were. He said, I, I'm not going to believe. Now, let's keep reading verse 26. After eight days, his disciples went inside. They're hiding out again. But this time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Now, hey, get this. You're already a little freaked out anyways <laughs> because there's people after you, and here you are telling people Jesus is alive. You're meeting with all your buddies. You're hanging out. You lock all the doors, and then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. I thought we had the doors locked. <laughs> And everybody starts freaking out. But Jesus, he says, guys, don't freak out. He says, cool, peace be with you. Listen, guys, he, in other words, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, even though I just basically appeared out of nowhere. He said, don't be afraid. Peace be with you. And now all of a sudden, whoa, there's Jesus. Jesus just showed up. This is incredible. He just showed up in the middle of the room. And then the very first thing he does after he says, don't be scared, is he looks at Thomas. 
And he says, hey, Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. And reach your hand here. Put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. He said, Thomas, I'm so concerned about you and I care so much for you and it's so important to me that you recognize that I did everything I said I was going to do. Look, here's, here's my hands. Let me see your finger. You feel that? That's, that's where the print of the nails were. Now think, think about this. Jesus has only been alive for just a couple of weeks. Now, it's going to take more than a couple of weeks from all of those wounds and scars to heal up. Okay, so when Christ was resurrected from the dead, did he look, was he recognizable? Obviously, he didn't scare anybody away. But just think if you were to take that body out of the grave, unwrap the, 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 the clothing that he was wrapped in, all those linens, you unwrap that, imagine what he would have looked like. Imagine how scarred and how, how, how bloody and how beaten. Imagine there, wouldn't, there would have been a lot more than just some prints in his hands. He had a crown of thorns shoved on his head. There would have been holes and scars all in the crown of his head. There would have been stripes and scars all over his body, all over his arms, everywhere. He would have still had black eyes and, and he still would have had you know, just, just bruises all over his body. Thomas, I'm here. But he didn't say that. Think about this. Nobody ran away from Jesus. They weren't scared of him. So obviously when Jesus showed up, he showed up as a whole man that was healed, that, was, that didn't have any scars or any wounds from all of the beatings and all of the things that happened to him on the cross. But yet he chose to retain certain scars. Why? Why? Why would Jesus choose to have prints of the nails in his hands? He didn't have to. There were no other obvious scarring on his body. There was no other bruising on his body that would alert or scare anyone. He wasn't walking as a, as a beaten man. No, he was whole. But yet he chose to retain scars in his hands and in his side from where the soldier pierced him and blood and water flowed. Why? For Thomas, for Thomas, this should give us a picture of how big the love of God is, how big the grace of God is, how big the mercy of God is, that even after he is resurrected from this beaten and bloodied state, he still chooses to retain certain scars. Which scars? The very ones that Thomas said he needed to see to believe. Oh, folks, let me tell you something. Jesus purposefully retained these scars for Thomas. He didn't retain every scar, but he did retain those for Thomas because he chose to use what he had been through to reach someone who didn't believe until they saw something real. They wanted to know Jesus is real. You see, us <laughs> today, we have scars that are retained in our life from the things that we've been through, from the things we've experienced, from the wounds of our past. And a lot of times we try to hide those scars. We try to hide those scars because naturally, I mean, we don't want to show everybody our scars. We'll purposefully wear, you know, maybe something that has long sleeves or we'll wear, you know, maybe uh, if we have scarring in certain areas, you know, we don't want anybody to see that. We're ashamed, we're embarrassed of our scars unless it's a really good one that has an awesome story with it. <laughs> And you're a guy. But a lot of times we hide our scars. We, we hide those wounds because the thing is that we don't want anybody to see it because we're embarrassed of it because it represents something shameful or painful in our lives. And it's the same thing with the stuff that you and I have been through in our lives is that we'll try to hide those things that we've been through. We'll try to hide those things because we're ashamed, because of all of the junk that we've been through. We don't, we don't want to reopen that. We, we want to hide it. And that's how we deal with it. Because scars represent pain, they represent wounds, they represent, you know, something that hurt, or something that's shameful. But we need to remember that when you do have a scar on your body, that yes, it does represent where pain once was, but not where pain currently is. Scars represent healing. 
You see, Jesus was showing Thomas, listen, I'm just not showing you where the wound is, but I'm showing you where the healing is also. I'm showing you where I am complete and where I'm whole. And Jesus is showing us with his example, with his life, something that you and I can learn from and something we can glean from. And that is that our scars can be used. Our wounds can be used. The things that we've been through can be used to help reach someone who needs to touch and feel something that is real that may be unbelieving. Someone that can be real with them. Someone that can say, I understand where you're at. And we show them our scars. And look, I'm, I can be touched. Look, I, I'm, I'm real. I don't have everything together. I'm not perfect. And it gives us purpose beyond the grave. It gives us purpose beyond the wounds of our past. You see, we just have to see those things as areas of healing in our lives instead of pain. But some of us will hide those things because we have not allowed God to truly heal those wounds yet or heal those pain because we're like a little kid. We keep scratching it back open over and over again. Or heck, maybe not even like a little kid, maybe an adult because I can't stop scratching something like that. I go get my G.I. Joe Band-Aids and put it on there just like everybody else. And then I peel it off and I just start scratching on it again. But let me tell you something, folks. We've got to give it to Jesus if we ever want to experience that healing. And some of those wounds in our lives aren't healed because we keep putting our mouth on it. Or we keep revisiting those same places in those same areas. And we have those same feelings we had before because we get just as mad as we did when maybe that thing first happened. Or we feel just as much shame as we did when that thing first happened. You know, there were certain things in my life that I know that if I go to certain areas in particular, there's a certain town that I lived in, that if I go there and drive past certain buildings, I remember how it felt when I was trying to do business with this person or that person, how angry I would get. And if I'm not careful, I can begin to replay that in my mind. You know, we keep a really good log, a really good playlist of all those things in our heart that have happened to us, and we hit the rewind button and hit the play button all too often, and we just replay it. And we revisit those same emotions and sometimes those things can build and we get even more angrier than we were initially or more hurt or more bitter or more depressed or whatever the case may be. We just hit rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind, play. And we just get so mad. We just keep reopening the wounds. When Jesus said, listen, if you will just give this to me, let me carry your sorrows. If you will just trust me with this, if you will allow my grace and my love for you to be big enough for you to be able to grow and find healing in this, there is purpose beyond the hurt. There is purpose beyond the wound. There is purpose beyond the pain. And these things can one day be used to reach someone who is unbelieving. There is healing, folks. There is healing. You see, God wants to bring healing so you can be made whole and so your story can help bring healing to others. He wants you to be made whole. That's his desire. He wants to bring healing because he wants you to be made whole so your story can help bring healing to others. I'm not talking about people being perfect. I'm not talking about people having everything figured out or having all the answers. But I am talking about people being real. People are looking for something. They're looking for something that's real. They don't just want to hear about it. They don't want to hear about how good and wonderful it is. They want to be able to touch it. They want to be able to know that it's real. They don't just want to hear about it. They want to know that somebody can level with them and understand where they're at and be vulnerable and be open and say, listen, this is what God has brought me through. This is what I've seen in my life. This is the hurt that I've experienced. This is how I sometimes feel in this situation or that situation. And I'm not all put together, and I don't have it all figured out. But I am on a journey just like you're on a journey. Let me tell you what God has brought me through. Let me tell you how He's brought healing. Let me tell you how He's brought restoration. Let me tell you how you really can put your faith and your hope and your trust in Him. Because let me tell you what He's done in my life. People are looking for someone that's real. They're looking for someone who's genuine, not someone who's perfect. You see, when we lose our authenticity and we just simply try to convince everyone else that we're elitists because of our accomplishments or our seemingly spiritual maturity, then we become disconnected from our purpose. We become disconnected from being able to be touched. We become disconnected from being real with other people. Because we're trying to convince everyone that we're just so put together. <laughs> that we're elite in our spirituality and we can't button our buttons when we're trying to make a point. 
And we just try to present ourselves as just having everything together, and we have no problems at all. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, the children are just perfect. Oh, the wife is perfect. Oh, everything's just absolutely lovely. We have no problems at all. And when we try to act like we got it all together and we just try to convince everybody that we're somehow spiritual elitists, we become disconnected. We need to let people know, listen, I understand where you're at. Yeah, I, I, I may have overcome some of those things and I may not be dealing with those things like I used to deal with them. But let me tell you, I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to be in that chaotic situation. Here, touch me. I'm real. I'm willing to be vulnerable with you, even if it means that I put myself out there to where you may have a different opinion of me. Because a lot of times we don't want people to think any different of us, so we just hide. We hide all that stuff, and we don't ever let our wounds help to heal other people because we don't want them to know about that. We don't want to put a video out and let people know we was in jail. Oh, we don't want to let people know about our, our mistakes because, oh, now people are going to think differently of me. Oh, I don't want to. Listen, you don't understand. It's the same thing as what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just go around and try to convince everybody how awesome he was and hang out with just the spiritually elite. Who did Jesus hang out with? He hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors. Tax collectors were thieves because during Jesus' day, the Romans were occupying... Jerusalem, and because they were occupying, when you paid taxes, you were paying taxes to the Roman Empire. So when they're tax collectors, that was like betraying your own country, man. That's why they hated those guys so much, because they were collecting taxes to give to the Romans. And they were like, man, you're betraying our country, you're betraying Jerusalem. And these people were thieves, man. They were wicked underhanded because they would try to slip a little bit of money under the table, all types of things, man. But yet Jesus said, I'm going to hang out with you. Why don't you come hang out? Why don't you come follow me? A tax collector? A betrayer? You're going to let someone that's been a prostitute wash your feet? Dry them with her hair? What's wrong with you, Jesus? I'll tell you what. Jesus said, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be someone that can be touched, that can level with people, that is not a spiritual elitist. Because a lot of times we won't even associate with certain people because we just feel like we're just too good for that. Jesus didn't feel like he was too good, did he? I said, Jesus didn't feel like he was too good. Jesus said, no, I'm going to hang out with these people and show them love, even in the middle of their sin, even in the middle of their junk, even in the middle of all of their hang-ups. I'm going to love them right where they're at. Yeah, it might not make, you, make me popular here on earth, yeah, it might not, you know, earn me a lot of respect with those people that are higher up in the community, but I'm going to do it because it's more important for me to reach those people and to show them love and to show them the truth, to help them to be set free than it is for people to think I'm so great. Matter of fact, they thought Jesus was so great, they decided to kill him. That's how great the religious leaders thought Jesus was. Oh, we think you're so great, we're going to crucify you because we can't stand you. Because you break all the rules. Because you do all the things you're not supposed to do. You're, 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 you're hanging out with all the wrong people. You're hanging out with the wrong crowd, Jesus. What's wrong with you? And they always tried to catch him slipping up or messing up. And folks, it's the same scenario that we're in today. We have an opportunity. Are we going to be like the religious leaders, the Pharisees, that wanted to be elitists? Or are we going to be real like Jesus was, even if it costs us someone else's opinion? We worship at the feet of people's opinions all too often. And we are way too concerned with what everybody thinks about us. We feel like we've got to wear a certain kind of clothes, drive a certain kind of car, have certain kind of friends that act a certain way. When Jesus is just saying, listen, just be real, love people. You know, if you really love God, you're going to love people. I said, if you really love God, you're going to love people. You can't stand it. You're not going to be able to do it. You can't say you love God whom you have not seen and don't love your brother whom you can see. You can't do it. You've got to break down this wall of pride that keeps us from being relatable, that keeps us from being real, that keeps us from caring. And I'm not... Glasses are coming off. <laughs> Y'all just going to have to hang on. I'm not talking about the kind of caring that sometimes church people do 
And you know what I mean when I say, oh, well, bless your little heart. I'm talking about people being real. I'm talking about people authentically caring about one another and not just saying that they do or putting a nice slogan up on a big red wall. I'm talking about people actually doing it and living it. Being uncomfortable to reach someone else. Being vulnerable to level with somebody and let them know, I understand the, th the things you're dealing with and I care about you enough to help you. We're so quick to judge. We're so quick to give people the boot. We're so quick to just want to point fingers and say, you should, you should, you should. And we're very slow just to reach out and to just hold someone in our arms and let them know everything's going to be all right and pray for them and love on them and let them know somebody cares. Why are we so slow to do that, but we're so quick to point fingers and tell everybody what they need to be doing? Like, we ain't ever been in no tough situation, or we've never been dealing with any type of sin in our lives. We get so disconnected because we think we're so better, and we're not. We're not. We're just folks that are on a journey growing in grace. That's all we are. Nobody is better than anybody. I don't care how good and moral you are in the eyes of Christ. We are all the same because we all cost the same. Now we got to let this stuff go. And we got to start loving one another because this love will be infectious. And it will change our heart and our perspective. And the little hang-ups we had before won't be hang-ups anymore because we care more about the person than we do the problem. Oh, that'll preach right there. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that and make a sermon series or something. We need to care more about the person than we do the problem. <coughs> and be willing to do whatever it takes to love the person. Love knows no limits. We have limits. We, we have our limits of how much we'll forgive and how much... Whoa, 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 whoa. You did what? Oh, man. Um, sorry, I'm not going to be able to help you with that one. People are afraid to be real with one another because they're afraid of being judged, because they're afraid of other people's opinion. And so we walk around with this mask, and we mask our woundedness, and we mask our struggles, and we mask our pain... When the people that even look like they got it all together, they still have struggles and wounds and pain. We just all need to be real and let some doubting Thomas touch us. Because there are Thomases all out in this world that need to be reached. There are Thomases all out in this world that need to hear the gospel and need to experience the love and truth of Jesus Christ. They just need somebody to say, hey, let me show you my scar. Hey, let me show you my wound. Let me be so vulnerable to put my story up on a video in front of hundreds of people this weekend. Let me be that vulnerable because if it reaches somebody, then it's worth it. You know what? You, you know somebody who will put their story on a video? You know what that shows me? That shows me that they understand healing and they understand what's really important. That it's not important what somebody thinks about me because I reveal my scars. It's more important that somebody else gets reached because I was real. Amen. This ain't even what I was going to preach today. Thank you, Ms. Young. <laughs> but folks, let me tell you, we've got to be real. And that's what it all boils down to. Don't be afraid to show your scars to someone because they don't just represent pain. Remember, they represent where pain once was dealt. But now because of Jesus, he has healed us and set us free. It's Jesus alone who's made us whole. We need to rest in his finished work and share our story. Revelation 12 and 11 speaks of those who went through tribulation period who were tortured and beaten for the cause of Christ and for the sake of Christ. The martyrs. But they overcame. They finished their race. And the Bible says this about them. It says they overcame the evil one by these two things. By the blood of the Lamb, which is the thing that they could not do. But the other thing was they overcame by the word of their testimony. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ that set us free. His sacrifice. His blood that was shed. They overcame by that blood and by the word of their testimony. Their story. 
Let me tell you where I've been. Let me tell you what I've done. Let me tell you how Christ has set me free. Let me tell you how Christ has restored things. Let me tell you how he's made all things new. Let me tell you how I'm not perfect, but, but, but I'll tell you, I'm on this journey, and God has brought me a long ways from where I once was. And now because of that, I'm real, I'm touchable, and I'm free And I'm growing in that understanding of freedom. I'm growing in that understanding of grace. I'm not perfect, not that I've already obtained, but I'm pressing towards the mark. I'm pressing. I'm not giving up. I'm not saying it's over. I'm not saying I got it all together, but it's not over either. I'm not just going to hit cruise control and coast. No, I'm still pressing. I'm overcoming every day by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Because, folks, when Jesus said it is finished, he he, he meant it is finished. And he meant freedom is here. It is finished Freedom is here. Because freedom's not going to be. Freedom's not was. Freedom is now. The Son has set you free. The Bible says if the Son has set you free, then you are what? Free? Indeed. You're free indeed. It is finished. And freedom is here. You see, He's healed us and made us whole. And even our scars can be used for His glory. Our scars, our story that once brought us shame, the things in our past, that, I'm, that, that I, rec- I recognize that I'm not ashamed now of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Romans 1 and 16 says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's our story. It's us growing in grace and understanding how big Jesus is. And how free and forgiven we really are. We never stop growing in our understanding of how big His grace is. How big His mercy is for us. Because as we grow, we share We help others to grow in grace by telling others how amazing His grace has been in our lives. So it's not over for you. So look at somebody and tell them it's not over. Have y'all ever been to this church before? (laughs) Maybe you haven't. Maybe it's your first time here. But maybe you need to look at somebody and let's say it again. It's not over. Oh, you got to say it. E- e- even if you ain't sitting by somebody, like, 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 like Brother Gary here, he's not sitting by anybody, just holler at somebody over here and just tell them, say, it's not over. Come on, somebody. There you go. You see, we've got to remind one another that the race is not over, that we're not done, that this thing is not over, that I just don't quit, that I don't just coast once I have accomplished certain things in my life, that I'm constantly growing in my understanding of His Word and His truth and His grace and how big that is, that I'm constantly growing in my understanding of being able to share my wounds, share my scars, share where that pain was, share where maybe some things that I was disappointed in myself or my failures or my weaknesses because it just might level with somebody and help somebody that's a Thomas that's unbelieving that needs to see and touch and feel Jesus because you're the only Jesus this world is going to see. Jesus is ascended. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. That's why He's empowered us with His Holy Spirit to be representatives of Him in the earth. It's what 2 Corinthians 5 and 20 says. Now you're representatives of Christ. You're ambassadors of Christ. That's our job now is to be the Jesus, to be the love, to be the truth that others can touch, see, and feel. And we've got to be real if we're going to be like Jesus. Amen. Amen, somebody. It is finished. Freedom is here. It's not over for you. You don't have to live chained to that habit or that mistake. You don't have to live chained to those events and that shame and that guilt and that pain. It's time for us to trust Jesus today. To trust Him. That His grace is amazing. That His forgiveness is big. That His grace is something that I'm constantly growing and gaining new understanding in. And it's causing me to be real. To be touchable like Christ was to Thomas. Would you bow your heads this morning? Maybe you're here in this place today. You say, Pastor Derek, I'm hearing what you're saying about Jesus and freedom and all these wonderful things and I want to experience that in my life. Maybe today needs to be my Easter experience that helps propel me, that helps be a catalyst to me to grow in that freedom and not be chained to my past, not be chained to the wounds and the scar and the pain but, but to live free and to find healing. You say, yeah, that's me. I'm ready to give my heart to Christ and start this new chapter of my story. If that's you in this place, I don't want to embarrass you. Everybody's got their head bowed. I just simply want you to let me know you're here by lifting your hand and putting it back down. I see those hands. I see that hand. You can put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. The reason I ask you to lift your hand is because I need you to 
recognize your need for Christ. You're saying, hey, I recognize that I need him. I need him, and I'm ready to put my faith and my trust in him. Trust that he's the God that heals me, that sets me free. He's the God that helps me to continue on my story and find restoration to where one day I can be vulnerable enough and be real, and I can say, listen, this is what God's brought me through. This is where I once was, and this is what Jesus did, and it just might reach somebody else. So church, would you help me out this morning with those that lifted their hands by saying this prayer after me? Say, Jesus, I give you my heart. I welcome you in and trust you that what you did on the cross was good enough to forgive me of my sins. So I repent and ask you to make all things new. And I trust you from this day forward with my life. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for being my Lord. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for making all things new. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you look back up here? If you said that prayer today, I want you to let me know.